We have an expression we use when someone shows up unexpectedly. When we meet someone we've wanted to meet or haven't met in a long time, we sometimes say, look who's here. And that's my subject. And I don't mean me, and I don't mean you either. It could be used many times in the Bible, and the equivalent of it is, Behold the Lamb of God, behold a greater than Jonas is here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I come quickly. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Those are just a few samples. The Israelites in the wilderness, pilgrims and strangers with Egypt behind them and the promised land ahead, tempted to despair and even to rebellion. But God was with them. And many a night a discouraged Hebrew could pull open the flap of his tent and look up and see that pillar of fire high in the sky. And he might well have said, we're not alone. Look who's here. And then there was Daniel in the lion's den. We have the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Club and the Elks Club. But Daniel got in the lion's club (laughs) a long time ago. And uh, the Bible says, however, that he wasn't the one who couldn't sleep. It was Darius. He was the ruler of a mighty empire, but he couldn't sleep. Lived in a magnificent palace, but he couldn't sleep. His bed was covered with the choicest of tapestries, but he couldn't sleep. Went down to the lines then, called in and said, How are you doing, Daniel? Daniel said, Your Majesty, you might as well arrest him. Look who's here. I had company all night. And uh, the Lord just millennialized these old lines. I just laid my head on the main and one of them slept fine. Thank you. You didn't need to be hunting your salmon eggs all night. I was doing all right. Look who's here. And then one thinks of the three Hebrew children. This time it was Nebuchadnezzar. And he went down to look on and said something strange here. I threw in three and I see four. They could have said, look, who's here? We've got company. They wouldn't bow and they wouldn't bend and they wouldn't burn. When they came out, there wasn't even the smell of the smoke on them. I like that. I'm glad the Holy Spirit put that in. You know the trouble with some people who suffer a little for the Lord, you never hear the last of it. (laughs) All the rest of their lives, you get the smell of the smoke every time if you've been in a fiery furnace, ask the Lord to take away the smell of the smoke because we've got enough troubles of our own and it'll help us a great deal if you'll do that. <laughs> I was with Dr. Stanley in the First Church of Atlanta and he was telling me about some of his trials and tribulations of some time ago and the lady of the church gave him a picture of Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel looking up and the lion's all back of him. She said, Dr. Every time you look at this picture, I want you to remember that Daniel is not looking at the lions. It's a good thing to remember. Then there was Elijah on Carmel. They'd had a dry spell. It hadn't rained on the just or the unjust. There had to be a confrontation on earth before there could be an intervention from heaven. And that's true of revival any time. There has to be a showdown before there are any showers of blessings. He repaired the altar, prepared the sacrifice, for it's useless to expect the fire from heaven when the altar is not repaired and the sacrifice is not prepared. But he did something extra, and I've never heard anybody preach about this part of it, poured 12 barrels of water all over that sacrifice. Now don't forget the water was a very scarce commodity in that country then. It had a drought for a long, long time. And yet, poured out 12 barrels of it. He wanted to make it perfectly clear to those people and no tricks about this thing. And nothing's going to happen unless God moves on to the scene. Today we try to help the Lord out a little. We build a little fire so God won't have so much trouble. We try to warm up the altar and help God out. But Elijah drenched it. And I tell people all over the country, it's the drenched altar that God sets on fire. When you've done your dead level best, You've done all the repairing and all the preparing. 
Count your richest gain but loss and pour contempt on all your pride. And say, Lord, we, uh, we've done all we know. Now you will still have to intervene before anything happens. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down. It takes that. We've had our organizational meetings. We've had our study courses. We've had our committees, a group of the unfit, appointed by the unwilling to do the unnecessary. <laughs> but nothing is going to happen. Unless God moves in. So if I, sometimes I think I'd like to recommend one more committee. I hate to do it. But one more committee, the water pouring committee. After we've done all the rest, let's still realize that it was when Elijah drenched the altar. And then asked God to set fire to that soggy sacrifice that the miracle happened. If it hadn't, Elijah would have been the laughing stock of the whole country. When we are prepared to be called fools for Christ's sake, and he would have been uh, something to uh, uh, joke about if nothing had taken place, the fire falls. We're playing it safe today. Uh, Dr. Hill, that great black preacher from Los Angeles, tells us about this in another way, all his own, you know. He said, you've got to get into something before God moves in. Hebrew children had to get in the fiery furnace. Daniel had to get in the lion's den. You've got to get into a situation that requires divine intervention. God's not going to come down and meet with us in the basement of some church sipping a little hot chocolate and discussing the minutes of the last meeting. Something's got to happen. When he does come down, the doubting multitude will have to say, The Lord, he is God. Look who's here. It takes that. And then there was Elisha, the prophet of God. What a man to have around. He was equal in his situation. He could supply the city with good drinking water, recover lost axe heads, make poison food fit to eat, put a poor widow in the oil business at a prophet, heal lepers, and raise the dead. And uh, he was also a one-man built-in CIA, a central intelligence agency. Because every time the king of Syria started to make a move, old Elisha had a hotline to heaven and heard about it first. And the king said, we got to get that preacher. So he sent the militia after him. Maybe we need preachers today. They send the army after him. And so here they came. And the servant of Elisha came out and looked. And lo and behold, there were soldiers to the right of him, soldiers to the left of him. Here a soldier, there a soldier, everywhere a soldier. Ran in and said, they've got us this time. We're surrounded. Old Elisha said, There be more that be with us, and they that be with them. And I think that old servant must have said, Well, I don't see them. Where are they? All I see is soldiers. And then Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. When he opened his eyes, he looked up. He saw angels to the right of him, and angels to the left of him. Here an angel, there an angel, everywhere an angel. Because the angel of the Lord was encamping round about them here to deliver. You see, it makes a difference when you're looking up instead of when you're looking down. Now, if you're going by what you read in the paper and see on television, may the Lord help you. Get your sights up. Uh, your vision's bad. Maybe you need your glasses cleaned. You can't be optimistic with a misty optic. Get your eyes cleared up. And let the Lord open your eyes and you will see things you didn't even know were there. The outlook's bad. I grant you that. But the uplook's good. It's as good as ever. I've quit saying civilization going to the dogs out of respect for dogs. <laughs> I wouldn't want to insult the canine kingdom with any such remark as that. But a preacher friend of mine said some time ago, he said, you know, every time... I hear a Walter Cronkite saying, that's the way it is. I like to say, no, Walter, that's not the way it is. That's just the way it looks. And that's right. Sometimes I walk an awful lot. I like to quote as I walk the words James Russell Lowell, that matchless poem of his, careless seems the great avenger. Sometimes it looks like God's mighty slow coming down here to break in and help us out. You remember our Lord's story of the widow, avenge me, vindicate me. 
set things straight, Lord. My adversary is pressing hard upon my life. Careless seems the great avenger history's pages but record. One death grapple in the darkness twixt old systems and the word. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. That's the way it looks. But that's not the way it is. But that scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown standeth God. Within the shadows keeping watch above his own. That's the way it is. God's on the job. He's around. But all the way through the Bible, we just keep running into this sort of thing. Peter and John. And the lame man, the gate of the temple. They said, look on us. Not what great preachers we are, but we represent somebody. You can't see him, but he's here. Look who's here. There was a lameness. There was a look. There was a lift. And there was a leap. All in that story. And uh, Peter said, now, his name, through faith in his name, will make a difference. You may have come in here limping, but you'll go out leaping. And that's exactly what happened. No wonder Charles Wesley wrote that verse that I can't find in any Baptist hymnal. I don't know why. I know he wrote a lot of verses about that, but I wish they'd left this one in. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come and leap, ye lame, for joy. Why did they leave that out? Did he think that uh, some Baptists would be afraid we'd take that literally? Well, no one Baptist like I did, I don't, like I do, I don't think there's the slightest danger in the world. Because we're not likely to break out with leaping to the glory of God. The possibility is so remote. Uh, let's not worry about that. But oh, every meeting we have ought to say to a crippled world, look who's here. You can't see him, but he's here because he said he'd be. If he's not here, what are we doing here? Might as well have stayed at home. Everything depends on the fact he said, if you gather in my name, I'll be there. And he is. Not look at our church and listen to our choir and listen to our preacher. That's important. But how many meetings have you been in in the last year from which you came out saying, the Lord was there? I bother about that. I'm going to be honest with you. I think I could count on my fingers in the run of a year. And it, it, it bothers me. I think of the little girl the church. They had a picture of Jesus back of the pulpit. And when the minister rose to preach, he generally obscured part of that picture. One morning the preacher was late getting in and the little girl asked her mother, Mama, where's the man who stands so you can't see Jesus? That's a worthwhile question. You can do that in a Sunday school class trying to teach it. You can do it in the pulpit. You can do it in your daily life. You get in the way of Jesus. I heard Dr. Edmund of Wheaton some years ago at Winona Lake say, when I went to the old Bible conferences as a boy, a young fellow, I didn't want to talk to anybody after the sermon. I wanted to go to my room, talk to God. I said, no, I start home and I hear folks say, well, how would you like him? Somebody said, not as good as the preacher we had last week. You ought to hear the ones coming next week. Paul, Cephas, Paulus. Or oh, you'll hear them raving about it was fabulous or it was fantastic. I don't know what we'd do in this world today if we didn't have fabulous and fantastic. We just about worn them out. And fabulous comes from fable and it means it's not true. And fantastic comes from fantasy and means it's not real. So you better get some better words. These won't work. When you say it's fabulous, you're just saying taint so. So we better change our vocabulary. When Jesus was on earth, he stopped at Jacob's well and talked to a poor wicked woman. Talked about the water of life. She said, but... You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Now she was right in the facts, wrong in the conclusion. She didn't know who was there. What difference would it make if the well is deep and there's nothing to draw with? Look who's there. When Jesus Christ is there, these things don't matter. And at Bethany, Martha said, I know my brother will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Now she was a good fundamentalist. 
She was right in the facts, but wrong in the conclusion. It wasn't doing her much good that day. She failed to realize that the resurrection is not primarily a doctrine. It's somebody. I am the resurrection and the life. You don't even have to wait for the resurrection. I'm here right now. And then at the grave, he said, roll away the stone, Martha. Poor soul must have got out on the wrong side of the bed that morning. She'd said, when he got down there, lady, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened, you know. And now she said, well, he's been dead for several days, and I wouldn't advise rolling away the stone. Create an unpleasant situation. I've been in churches where they didn't want to roll away the stone, get the trouble out of the way, and it would have created an unpleasant situation if we'd done that. But that's what the Lord was waiting for. All other considerations don't matter if Jesus Christ is there. He's all that matters. And there are those scoffers who ask, where's the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uh, Cause and effect, that's all. God's nowhere, and we need to chalk that in too and make it read, God is now here. Look who's here. Then I think of that day when Jesus was taking a nap in that little boat in the Sea of Galilee. And the storm came up. And they woke him up, careless thou not that we perish. They forgot who was there. I was with Dr. Francisco of Louisville Seminary in a conference some years ago. And he blessed my soul with this statement. I've never forgotten it. He said, God gave Adam dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the fish of the sea. But he did not give the first Adam dominion over wind and water. We can use them, but we don't have dominion over them. (laughs) You learned that some time ago, last spring. But, he said, this time the wind and the water got together on the Sea of Galilee and stirred up quite a fuss. But thank God there was in that boat the last Adam. And he had dominion over the wind and the water too. And got up and said, be quiet and the surface of that sea looked like a mirror in just a few moments and those poor disciples said what manner of man is this that the wind and the sea obey him now if that doesn't make you feel like going out here not one foot saying amen the other saying hallelujah you're in a backslidden condition my friend that's something to rejoice about and then one day Jesus had a crowd nothing to eat And he turned to Philip. He knew what he was going to do. The Lord is never stumped. He knows what he's going to do. But to try them out, he said, now we're going to feed this crowd. (laughs) Poor old Philip got out his notebook and started figuring. Eh, 200 penny worth of bread, that wouldn't do it. Doesn't that sound just like the chairman of the finance committee? The nest sounds just like a Southern Baptist making an estimate. And Jesus must have felt like saying, put up your little notebook. I don't need a budget, I need a boy with a few loaves and fishes. That'll do it. Philip didn't know what to do. But the Lord knew what to do. When Jesus Christ is there, put up your little computer. Who cares about 200 penny worth of bread? The Lord's around. One of the greatest Baptists we ever had in this country was Gambrel of Texas. With his wit and his clear-cut way of saying things, he said, not since the beginning of the Christian era has anyone heard so much of experts in religion, nor have we ever heard so much about the business end of religion. And good figuring on how long it'll take to convert the world. And nice calculations on how many dollars it takes to convert a soul. We're in a day of planning and figuring. Certain men have gotten themselves before the world as great religious statesmen. And their methods are so fine that the common man feels he doesn't know where to begin. I am writing it down, he said, now deliberately, that all this looking over the situation and considering the circumstances and parceling out the world to be converted in a given time and fitting up nice harness for everybody to work in makes me tired. While the experts are telling us all about it and organizing everything, some men that don't seem to know much are holding good meetings and nearly all the people that are converted are converted by non-experts. 
I'm tired of all the fine figuring and wonderfully fine statesmanship up in the air. Uh, if we don't watch, we are going to be snared by human wisdom and human devices. We'll get away from the simple method of Christ, so simple that people can understand it. There is something greater. It is life and spirit. And then this prediction, take heed. We are going to wake up and find we have been weaving some fine theories that will enslave us and wear us out. I don't need to come in on that. After the resurrection, Jesus stood on the shore and the disciples had fished all night and hadn't caught a thing. That's one fish tale I believe in. Somebody said the only time a fisherman ever tells the truth is when he calls another fisherman a liar. And they said, we haven't got a thing. I marvel at those 40 days and the strange way that God arranged this whole business and the things that our Lord did. Why didn't he go to Rome and Athens and Alexandria and say, I'm out of the grave? Why didn't he go to Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate and say, here I am, you thought you got me, but you didn't. Because an angel rolled that big stone away and then sat on it, I like that. Sat on it as if to say, now look who's around here and in charge. But he didn't. Moved around among his disciples, nobody else saw him. Had time for a weeping woman at the sepulchre. Had time for troubled travelers on the way to Emmaus. Had time here to tell his disciples how to catch more fish. Which makes me happy to know that the risen Christ is interested in my little doings down here. Cast it over on the right side. And it was the right side. And we're like those Emmaus disciples too. They were trudging down the road. They said, we trusted past tense that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides, it's the third day. Well, it was that right in the facts, but wrong in their conclusion. They shouldn't have been going around looking like that. And because it was the third day, they should have gone down the road saying, Hallelujah, it's the third day. This is the day he's coming out. And he was walking right beside them for good measure. Well, we live in a glass house, beloved. We can't throw stones. Where two or three gather in my name, there am I. What would happen on the average Wednesday night prayer meeting if we ever took it seriously? We might not get home till morning. Do you ever hear old Billy Sunday take off on the weekly W-E-A-K-L-Y weekly prayer meeting? How many here ever heard Billy Sunday? Well, the crowd's thinning out, but you're still some of you survivors around here along with me. <laughs> Billy Sunday said, 15 minutes late to start with. Can't find anybody to play the piano. Finally, some dear sister feels moved upon to play the piano. Takes her five minutes to find the song and a couple more minutes to fix the bench. And then they all stand up and sing, throw out the lifeline. I haven't got strength enough to put up a clothesline. And then the leader gets up and says, I'm sorry, friends, but I didn't have time to prepare anything. Billy said, didn't need to have said that. You could tell he hadn't prepared anything. And then the crowd stands and sings, Day is dying in the West. He said, that's not the only thing dying around in that part of the country. And one reason is that we don't count on the unseen presence. When I hear somebody apologize for a slim crowd on Wednesday night, I can't help feeling when he quotes that precious verse about where two or three are gathered, that he's more conscious of the absence of the people than he is of the presence of the Lord. And then I hear somebody pray, Lord, be with us. I haven't prayed that prayer in 25 years. He is with us. He's already there. Now, I suppose they mean make us conscious, aware of thy presence. Evan Roberts was used so mightily of God in the Welsh Revival. They had about everything that they took for a revival, but none of the things we think you have to have. They didn't even have a choir. It was all choir. They didn't have songbooks, take up a collection, do any advertising. Didn't have a preacher a great deal of the time. Evan Roberts was it, and he was just a boy out of the mines. They had big preachers there. Campbell Morgan attended and sat back there, didn't get to preach. General Booth 
attended, didn't get to preach. Gypsy Smith showed up but didn't get to preach. They didn't need big preachers. They had God. That's all it took. And Evan Roberts knew that, but he was uneasy because people had got to where they were looking for him to show up. And if Evan Roberts didn't come, it wouldn't be a big meeting maybe. And he knew that wouldn't work. And one night he arrived late and the crowd was there and he walked out and said, Do you believe that where two or three are gathered there, the Lord is? Amen. Do you believe he's here tonight? Hallelujah. Then he said, You don't need me. And put on his hat and coat and left the meeting. Now, it was a dramatic way of driving home. You already have what you need. You didn't have to wait for me. Maybe we'll learn that today. Maybe after all the pack in the pew, the banana bunches, and pinning the tail on the donkey, and the talking horses, and the karate experts, and the theatrical personalities, and the expos and the explos and the extravaganzas. Maybe when we Baptists are completely tuckered out and we'll admit it for once, maybe God will come down and say, you folks have had it long enough. Now I'll take over. And I believe heaven will come down. I believe mercy will crown the seat of repentance. And we'll have a living Christ evident among his people. We had an awful spell of hand wringing last year over the drop in baptisms. Well, we should have had more, yes, but computerized statistics and charts and diagrams and percentages that boggle the mind. If we had this, if we had buildings, buses, budgets, we'd have more baptisms. We've already got what we need. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. How much more do you need? All things are delivered unto me of my Father. How, much, how many more things do you need? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How much more treasure do you need? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How much more do we need? And if we ever take it out of the realm of imagination, just imagine God's there, which isn't what it means. Believe He's there in the heart. Things will start happening. But may I remind you that every one of these people that I've talked about and many more besides in the book were desperate people. Daniel, the Hebrew children, Elijah, Elisha, Mary and Martha, Jairus, the disciples in the storm, the multitude with nothing to eat, Jacob at Jabbok, Moses in the Red Sea, David and Goliath, the four lepers in the gate of Samaria, Bartimaeus, the Seraphonician woman, and in the parables, the woman and the judge and the man with no bread at midnight. Every one of them desperate. And they got what they needed. But there was one chap in the Gospels who stood head and shoulders above all those, but they got their blessing and he missed his. And he was the rich young ruler. Money, morals, manners, that's a lot. But if you forget everything else I say tonight, we have a word we're using a lot these days, additive. Everything's got an additive. Food, everything. Medicine's had an additive put in. Jesus Christ is not an additive. That's the mistake Nicodemus made. He said, I, I'm a teacher in Israel, and if I can just get what he's got and add it to what I've got, I'll have it made. Jesus said, no, I'm not a new page in your old book. We're going to start a new book. You must be born again. And the rich young ruler thought, now I've got all this to my credit. If I can get eternal life, I'll have it made. Jesus said, no, you sell out what you've got. And we start over. And over there in Luke, those three prospective disciples sounded like they meant business. Jesus said to the first two, said, I'll follow you wherever you go. He said, I don't have any place to stay. The birds and the foxes do, but I don't. I don't hear any more from that brother. I think that took care of him. The second said, I'll follow you, but let me suffer me. Let me first go bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and preach. That man was called to preach. The third said, I'll go with you, but suffer me first. Allow me first to go tell the folks goodbye. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back fit for the kingdom of God. The trouble with those fellows, something else came ahead of Jesus. 
Let me first do this and then I'll follow you. You'll be next. Never forget it. Jesus Christ does not come next. He never comes next. He's Alpha and Omega, the author and the finisher, the beginning and the end. But he did say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And here's where the additives come in. All these things shall be added. The things that you need, food, clothing, things you need, will be added to you. But get the thing that's true order. And that's what the rich young ruler didn't do. But I like to think of that poor sick woman in Mark 5. She was nearly dead. Spent all her money on the doctors, worse instead of better. One morning she arose and maybe she said, perhaps I'll die today and I don't care if I do. And then she heard a noise and looked out and people were going all directions. She said, what's up? And they said, Jesus going through town. Well, she'd heard about him. Now let's get this straight. She didn't know anything about theology. She didn't know maybe much about Jesus except that she'd heard he was healing people and he was the head of the line down there and she thought, oh, can I possibly, as weak as I am, and the way I look, and no clothes fit to wear, get out here with all these folks and, and get through to His presence. But she was desperate. And when you're desperate, you will get through. Every time. She must have been a sight to see. Poor clothes. I'm sure some of those fast hideous folks must have said, why doesn't she stay back there where she belongs? Did you ever see what a dress? What, what does she mean barging up here? Ladies don't elbow their way through a crowd unless there's a sale on at the department store. What does she mean trying to get through a crowd like this? But she meant business. It says here that many people thronged him. Two words stand out all the way through. Many people thronged him, but only one sick woman touched him she said if I may touch but his clothes and then when she did she stopped the whole procession and Jesus turned and said who touched poor old Simon Peter as usual most American of all the disciples nearly everything he said in the gospels was a mistake thou seest the multitude thronging thee why would you ask with all this shove and crowd who touched me Jesus said, yes, but virtue has gone out of me. And then he had her to come forward and testify because there's nothing sneaky about this business of touching Jesus. And he wants you to let the word get around and testify. But you've got to be desperate, dear friend. I told it maybe when I was here before. But I remember that years ago, my wife and I were taking a little holiday in Montreat, North Carolina. Ruth Graham asked us up to Billy's home for supper. We went up there and Dr. Bell and Ms. Bell were there. Godly physician and his dear wife. And she, he told us as we sat there about the miraculous healing of his other daughter dying of tuberculosis in a hospital in Albuquerque. She was out of fix. She had, she was bitter. She wasn't right with God. She had never married. She was in a bad way, nearly dead. She got right with God lying there. And then she said, maybe God would heal me. She called in a few friends and they had prayer. And she said, I will not take any more treatment. And this doctor called up Dr. Bell. And the doctor himself said, he asked me over a long distance, what will I do? And I said, if that's what she wants done, we'll abide by her wishes. And she recovered. And she married. First of all, right with God. And the miracle followed. Now that doesn't happen every time. God didn't heal my dear wife. And we prayed and we prayed. But I came down that mountain on cloud nine that night saying, well... You do like to hear once in a while of a straight out undeniable in the day when so much fall to raw is going around today. The case where it happened. But whatever happens, when you get desperate about it, God moves into the picture and He did then. As I look over this congregation tonight, you look very comfortable and as though maybe you didn't have a trouble in the world, but I've faced people too long. 
There are people here tonight, no doubt, with problems that are about to get you. You don't know what to do about it. Oh, you have a... Try to put on a cheerful face, stiff upper lip philosophy. But maybe in the middle of the night, you can't sleep and you can't roll your burden somehow over on the Lord like you owe. You're desperate. We never had more desperate people than we have now in America. Travis Avenue Church, I went out there to preach to the older folks. And we met in the country club and looked like everybody was prosperous. But one thing they wanted me to talk about was loneliness. You'd think we wouldn't have much of that today with more amusement than we've ever had. More entertainment than ever. We never had more lonely people. Lonely in the crowd. Never had more desperate people. And they're drinking liquor and taking dope and killing themselves and everything and once in a while. Somebody gets through the throng. And touches Jesus. Now we've thronged him tonight. We've sung about him. We've heard the ministers talk about him. How long has it been since you touched him? Do you believe that he's here tonight? Do you really? Yes, we could have a unanimous vote. and All that sort of thing. But has it ever got from up here down here and you believe in your soul that he meant it and that he's here? And if he isn't here and if what he said isn't true, there's nothing else left but cause and effect, cause and effect, and you have to turn to science, and if science is all you can turn to, they can do some good things, but they can't meet this need. And if he didn't do what he came to do and come out of that grave, and if he isn't present today, God help us. But then you couldn't even believe in God. But if you're desperate, no preacher has to beg you to come forward or whatever else. you do it. And I'd like to ask you before we close, shall we bow our heads? I'd like to ask you. You've listened so well. How many dear hearts here tonight could say, Brother Havner, I have a special desperate need in my life. Now, we all have needs. We could all sing, I need thee every hour. I'm not talking about the run of the mill needs. I'm talking about that extra, that special, that need that's giving you trouble. It's desperate. Maybe nobody knows about it but you, and you can't tell anybody that you have a desperate need. Don't try to think it up, dear friend. If you have to think it up, you don't have it anyway, so don't, don't try to think it up. If, if you have it, you know it. And you're desperate about it. If you're here and you have a special need of the Lord for body, mind, or spirit, or for yourself, or for somebody else, or whatever it is, you have a special, deep, desperate need. Would you lift your hand right now all over the place? God bless you. It's that way all over the country. All over the country. I don't prolong this because your hand will go up if you have a desperate need. Before we close, one thinks of that old song, Pass Me Not, O oh, gentle sick. Let me at the throne of mercy find the sweet relief kneeling there in deep contrition. Help my unbelief. We Baptists have gotten so stiff-necked and stiff-kneed and dry-eyed. Your father and mother or your grandfather and grandmother used to go up and kneel and pray about a lost boy or a lost girl. And I don't know how long it's been since I've ever heard anybody say my boy or girl is lost. They don't use it anymore. You don't hear the note of desperation. My boy's a good boy, yes, so was the rich young ruler. He was a good boy, but he wasn't God's boy. And it was for those folks, the lost, that Jesus came. He came to seek and save them. But whatever your need is, if you're willing to touch the Lord for it tonight, if you need it, not talking about you want, you might want what you don't need. If it is according to the four accordings in the Bible, according to His Word, according to His will, according to your need, and according to your faith. That's like the four sides of a picture. 
If you put it in that frame, you can pray with confidence. I wonder, I'm just going to give you the opportunity, these desperate folks, would you be desperate enough right now to do something maybe you haven't done in years? And I'm not much on aisle parades these days, that sort of thing, but this is different. If you're desperate, would you mind slipping out from where you are and just coming down here and, oh, you don't have to kneel, but I, I think it's a lovely thing if you can get concerned enough just to kneel. And I'd like to pray with you out loud in just a moment as you pray for yourself. But would you like to, if you're desperate, you'll come. I'm just giving you the opportunity without singing right now as we wait. If we've got any desperate folks. Just come in here. I wouldn't beg anybody. You don't have to be begged. You have a desperate need of the Lord. Let me at the throne of mercy find the sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition Help my unbelief. They always come. First time I tried this, devil said it wouldn't work. I said it will work. People are desperate. They know it and they'll do something about it. And the great problem today is that we are not desperate enough about the need of the church. And Laodicea is rich and increased with goods and doesn't need anything. Dear Father, Thou seest these dear people. Thou knowest the hearts. Help them in simple faith, and the simpler the better, just to touch Thee. Maybe with a trembling hand. They may not understand all that's involved. If our little brains could take it all in, there wouldn't be much to it, and we wouldn't need faith. But help these dear ones. The simple faith to say, Lord, I don't know what to do about this. But you do. And I commit it to thee. And I'm going to trust you to give me the wisdom to know what I ought to do because you said, if you lack wisdom, ask, and it shall be given. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Help me to believe you will. And then help me to go home and make a ring around that verse, Mark 11, 24, whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Lord, I need wisdom. I need this and that. I think I do. It's more than a want. It's a need. I bring it to Thee and trust Him for the answer. We believe Thee. In Jesus' name, Amen.